All right. Well, I'm so happy that all of you could be here today. God ordained your steps to bring you here to this place on this Sunday afternoon, even though, as I said before, we're very small in number, but, um, but God wants to feed you with his word. Man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. So as we begin today, let us stand and sing hymn number 629, the Navy hymn on this Memorial Day weekend. Save whose arm doth bind the restless wave, who bids the mighty ocean deep its own appointed limits keep. O oh, hear us when we cry to thee for those in peril on the sea. O oh, Savior, who Almighty Word, the winds and waves submissive heard, who walked us on the foaming deep and calm amid its rage, didst sleep. Oh, hear us when we cry to thee for those in peril on the sea. O sacred spirit, who didst brood upon the chaos, dark and rude, who passed his angry tumult cease, and gavest light and life and peace. O hear us when we cry to thee for those in peril. On the sea, O Trinity of love and power, our brethren shield in danger's hour from rock and tempest, fire and foe, protect them wheresoe'er they go, and never let their eyes to thee. Glad hymns of praise from land and sea. Amen. <clears throat> Our text this afternoon is from John's Gospel, chapter 6 and verses 1 to 14. Verses 1 to 14 of the 6th chapter of John's Gospel. And the Apostle writes, After these things... Jesus went away to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, or Tiberias. A large crowd followed him because they saw the signs which he was performing on those who were sick. Then Jesus went up on a mountain, and there he sat down with his disciples. Now the Passover, the feast of the Jews, was near. Therefore, Jesus, lifting up his eyes and seeing that a large crowd was coming to him, said to Philip, Where are we to buy bread so that these may eat? This he was saying to test him, for he himself knew what he was intending to do. Philip answered him, Two hundred denarii worth of bread is not sufficient for them, for everyone to receive a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, There is a lad here who has five barley loaves and two fish. But what are these for so many people? Jesus said, Have the people sit down. Now there was much grass in the place, so the men sat down in number about 5,000. Then Jesus took the loaves and having given thanks... He distributed to those who were seated, likewise also of the fish, as much as they wanted. When they were filled, he said to his disciples, 
Gather up the leftover fragments so that nothing will be lost. So they gathered them up and filled twelve baskets with fragments from the five barley loaves which were left over by those who had eaten. Therefore, when the people saw the sign which he had performed, they said, This is truly the prophet who has come into the world. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. I love the Puritans, <clears throat> love reading the Puritans. They weren't always good. They weren't inspired like the authors of Scripture are inspired. But so much of what they said was really good stuff. The Puritan Thomas Watson said this, True love is not only full of benevolence, that is that it means well, that's what benevolence is, well-meaning, but also beneficence, that is, that it does well, or it does good for others. So true love is full of meaning well and also doing well toward others. If we've seen anything in our study of John's gospel so far, it is that Jesus is full of this love. He is full of benevolence and beneficence to all who come to him. He changes water into wine at the wedding feast when they ran out of wine. He beckons Nicodemus to believe the gospel and to be born again. He calls the woman, the Samaritan woman, to himself, asks her for a drink, and then offers her the living water which wells up to eternal life. Only he can do that. What benevolence and beneficence Christ has, even toward unworthy sinners. He heals the official son with a word. He heals the man who was invalid for 38 years. In chapter 5, as we learned, also with a word. All these and so much more in the Gospels display both the benevolence, the goodwill of God toward man in Christ, and the beneficence, the doing good. Jesus only ever always did good to people. He never did evil. He only did what was best. What was good? It's what love consists of, benevolence and beneficence. We see in other places, Jesus he cleanses the lepers. He heals the centurion's servant. He casts out demons from the garrison demoniac. He raises the dead. He does so many signs and so many wonders, all to the glory of God the Father and to the good of his people. In our text today, we're going to see Christ's benevolence and beneficence and his power displayed for us in the multiplying of the bread and the fish for 5,000 men, not counting women and children, with just five loaves of bread and two small fish. The text says, after these things, Jesus went away to the other side of the Sea of Galilee. What does he mean, after these things? Well, it's after the events of John chapter 5, where Jesus heals the invalid man. who have been there for 38 years, and the Pharisees begin persecuting him because Jesus did that miracle on the Sabbath. And because Jesus in his response to the Pharisees, explains to them that he only ever does what his father's will is because he's the son of God, because all who believe in him have eternal life in his name. Where does he do that? Well, we learn the events of John 5 take place all the way down in Jerusalem. 
Now, here in our text, it says after these things, so that is after Jesus heals the man at Bethesda in Jerusalem, he goes all the way to the other side of the Sea of Galilee. Do you know how far the other side, the far side of the Sea of Galilee is from Jerusalem, where Jesus just was in John 5? About 90 miles, 90 miles away. Why did Jesus travel 90 miles right after the events of John 5? Well, because we learn in John 5 that the leaders of the Jewish people want to murder him. And it was not yet his time. So he goes as far away from them as possible, all the way to the far desolate side of Galilee. But word still spread about him even there, that he was able to heal the sick, that he had even healed a man who had been paralyzed and invalid for 38 years, plus all the other miracles that Christ was doing. And the text says that the, the crowd followed him because they, look at what it says, verse 2, a large crowd followed him because they saw the signs which he was performing on those who were sick, who were diseased. And Jesus went up on the mountain and there he sat with his disciples. These people were following him because they saw the signs. What is the nature of a sign? The nature of a sign is to point the way. And that's what Christ's marvelous miracles did. They pointed the way to salvation. They pointed to him. They pointed to his identity as the Messiah and Savior and Son of God. The very nature of a sign is to point the way, and that's what Christ's marvelous, beneficent works did. They pointed the way to salvation and the way to the Savior. Of course, the Pharisees refused to see the signs. What does Romans 1 say? Or, uh, 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 yeah, it was. Yeah, Romans 1. What does Romans 1 say about the nature of unbelief? They suppress the truth in unrighteousness. It wasn't that the evidence for Christ wasn't there. Those men weren't disputing that Jesus had done stupendous, miraculous deeds. They weren't saying, ah, oh, here's a man lying here for 38 years and he's well now, but Jesus isn't the one who healed him. That's what, not what they were saying. What they were saying ultimately later on, as we'll see, they were saying that he was doing these things under the power of Beelzebub. <laughs> That's all they could do. They couldn't deny the fact that miraculous things were taking place. They saw them with their own eyes. They refused to believe that those things were signs of Christ's identity. That was the difference between the Pharisees and those who believed. Those who believed saw the signs for what they were. And they went and followed Christ. And wherever Jesus went, this crowd that saw the signs, they wanted to follow the Savior. Wherever he went, they went with him. And so Jesus and his disciples went up on the mountainside and sat down in all four Gospels, it talks about this same account of Jesus feeding the 5,000. In Matthew's and Luke's account, they both say that Jesus was healing the sick who were there. Mark says that Jesus was teaching the crowd that was there as well. Our text specifically says that the Passover was near. Perhaps that's what Jesus was teaching the crowd about. That he's our Passover lamb, the one who takes away the sin of the world, the one who carries our diseases and our sorrows. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. There's Jesus and his disciples on the mountainside, and this massive crowd is there to hear him speak 
and he's doing wonderful miracles right in front of their eyes, and they're all following him because of the signs. Because as Christ does these things, they're the signs of his identity, and they're believing on him. Jesus was teaching and healing, and the other Gospels record that it was getting quite late and that the people were very hungry. Look at what our text says next in verses 5 to 7. <clears throat> then Jesus lifted up his eyes, and seeing a great multitude coming toward him, he said to Philip, Where shall we buy bread that these may eat? But this he said to test him. For he himself knew what he would do. Philip answered him, Two hundred denarii worth of bread is not sufficient for them, that every one of them may have even a little. Christ had compassion on the people. He wasn't there reluctantly. He didn't want to send them away because he saw them as sheep without a shepherd. He didn't want to send them away in the evening time. And so he tests his disciple Philip, who was standing nearby, saying, where are we to buy bread so that these may eat? Do you know, I thought of something here as I was preparing this message that I never noticed before. It's amazing how, how you can read the text of the Bible your whole life. Now, of course, in my in case, I did not read it my whole life. I became a Christian at 22. But you can read the text of the Bible over and over and over and each time see something new, some fresh thing. The reason that we're able to do that, to see something fresh that we've never seen before in the Bible is because the Word of God is living and active. That's why. It's alive. This is the only book that's alive. We can read it and the Holy Spirit illuminates some new, beautiful gem of truth that you just never saw before, no matter how long you've read the Bible, no matter how long you've been walking with Christ. So that happened to me as I was preparing this message uh, this week. Here are Jesus and his disciples in this desolate area. He doesn't have any stores nearby. And Jesus specifically speaks to Philip. Now, in the other Gospels, it does not say Philip. It says that he spoke to his disciples. Not Philip. But here, John points out that the specific disciple that Jesus was speaking to was Philip. Where else have we heard about Philip? Well, I'm reminded of what Philip said to Nathaniel after he first met Jesus in John 1, verses 45 and onward. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, We have found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote. That's what Philip said. So when Philip went to evangelize Nathanael, the way that he did it is, he said, we found the one about whom Moses and the prophets also wrote. Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Philip was messianic prophecy minded, right? He's thinking about that. He's thinking about what Moses had written about the one who was to come. And he says, even after spending one day with Jesus, he's the one. He's the one. And he, he goes... And tells Nathaniel, and then of course brings Nathaniel, and Jesus says to him, Here is an Israelite in whom there is no guile. How do you know me? I saw you underneath the fig tree before Philip called you. Remember that? All right. So here's Philip, and Jesus specifically goes to Philip and says, Where are we to buy bread? Bread, so that these may eat. I find it fascinating that both Moses and bread are mentioned later on in this very chapter in verses 31 to 35. Look there. When the crowd started becoming more belligerent later on in this chapter, listen to what they said. 
Our fathers ate the manna in the wilderness. As it is written, he gave them bread out of heaven to eat. Look at that. And now they, they believe that the fathers were the ones that were doing this. Jesus then said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, it is not Moses who has given you the bread out of heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread out of heaven. For the bread of God is that which comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Then they said to him, Lord, always give us this bread. And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will not hunger, and he who believes in me will never thirst. So Philip is the one who tells Nathaniel, we found the one about whom Moses wrote. And then Jesus, later on in this chapter, talks about Moses in the wilderness. And he says, it wasn't Moses that gave you the bread, it was God. It was God. I believe that Jesus asked Philip specifically about the bread in order to show him that he was exactly right when he told Nathaniel that Jesus was he of whom Moses wrote about in the law. And Jesus knew. Jesus knew that that is what Philip said to Nathaniel. He knew it because he said, I saw you before Philip called you. So he heard the conversation. He heard Philip say, Jesus is the one about whom Moses wrote. And now in this chapter 6, Jesus is to asking Philip, where shall we get bread from, Philip? They're out in the wilderness. There's no 7-Eleven around. They can't go to the Jewel Osco. Where are we going to get bread from? And Philip is incredulous at Jesus' question, saying, 200 denarii worth of bread is not sufficient for them, even for everyone to receive even a little. Philip was trying to think rationally and practically here. They were facing the problem of being in a food desert. But additionally, even 200 days wages. You think about that. It's the average salary of person, let's just say, in America now. Even though this is a different time and a different place. Maybe let's say $50,000 a year. So 200 days wages is like what? What's two thirds of that? Two thirds. So even $30,000. Even $30,000, Lord, wouldn't be enough to feed this humongous crowd. 5,000 men plus women plus children. There's more children there probably than anyone else. Massive crowd, perhaps 20,000 people. $30,000 wouldn't be enough even for everyone to have just a little bit. What are we going to do? It was impossible for the disciples to feed such a crowd. But what is impossible with man is possible with God. There was no logical way or practical way to feed all of those people. Philip and the other disciples must have been exasperated when, as Mark records, Jesus says to them, you give them something to eat. Oh, man. You give them something to eat. I could give a whole message titled, you give them something to eat. I wish I could have seen the looks on Philip's face and the other disciples' faces when Jesus said that to them. What an incredible command I must have thought, but how, Lord? There's no way to do it. Perhaps the disciples should have gotten on their knees in that moment and prayed, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Amen. But what they still did not fully comprehend was that the living bread from heaven was among them, right in front of them. And he had the power to do the impossible. Look at verses 8 to 14. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, There is a lad here who has five 
barley loaves and two fish. But what are these for so many people? Jesus said, have the people sit down. Now, there was much grass in the place, so the men sat down in number about 5,000. Then Jesus took the loaves, and having given thanks, he distributed to those who were seated, likewise also of the fish, as much as they wanted. And when they were filled, he said to his disciples, gather up the leftover fragments, so that nothing will be lost. So they gathered them up, they filled the twelve baskets, twelve baskets with fragments of the five barley loaves which were left over by those who had eaten. Therefore, when the people saw the sign which he had performed, they said, truly this is the prophet who has come into the world. Oh, I love in verse 8 how it says, Andrew, Simon and Peter's brother, he's the one that comes and brings this small boy. Here's a lad. I don't, does it say that in, the, in your version, lad? A small boy. Here's a lad who has five barley loaves and two small fish. Andrew is um, one of my favorites. He's one of my favorite disciples of Jesus because he's always bringing people to Jesus. He's the one that goes to his brother Simon he says, come, you have to meet Jesus of Nazareth. He's the one who, in the face of, like, it's almost insane that Jesus would say, where are we going to buy bread to feed these people? And then Andrew says, oh, here's a boy with a little basket of bread and fish here. Here you go, Lord. <laughs> feed all of them with this. Like, what? What? I think it's because Andrew simply loved Jesus. And though he didn't know what Jesus was going to do, he knew that Jesus always has the answer. All we have to do, all I ever have to do, is just introduce people to Jesus. I don't know how to feed these people, but Jesus knows how. I don't know any other answer. Jesus knows the answer. He brings Simon to Jesus. And look how that turned out. He became Peter the Apostle. He brings this boy to Jesus, and look how that turned out. 5,000 plus women and children are all fed. Later on, there are some Greeks that say, we wish to see Jesus. You know who the disciple is who comes to Jesus and says, hey, there's some people here. They want to see you. It's Andrew. It's Andrew. He's the one that's always bringing people to Jesus. We should be like Andrew in that regard. He's such a pattern for us, such an example for us. I mean, even when it seems like, what could the Lord do with something so small? But if I know anything, I know Jesus has the answer. That's how Andrew was. That was his attitude. Five loaves of bread and two fish. He says, here's a lad who has five barley loaves and two fish, but what are these for so many people? Do you know what? Here's a, a Jeopardy quiz for you. Do you know what the modern industry standard is for how many slices one loaf of bread should have in a supermarket? Bet Bruce would know if anyone. <laughs> no. It's 18 plus the two end pieces. 18. So one, this is like, the, I looked it up. This is the industry standard. Every loaf of bread should have 18 slices plus the butt end pieces of the bread that no one likes to eat. All right. But if you use those, you could make 10 sandwiches from one loaf. Ten sandwiches with, if you cut up that those two small fish into tiny little pieces, and put a little tiny piece, and then there's five loaves, so ten times five is fifty. You could make fifty sandwiches with a tiny piece of fish on each one with what 
was brought to Jesus. 50 out of 5,000. Do you know how much that is? 1%. Andrew brought this boy who had enough food for 1% of the men who were there. And even that's like a really measly sandwich. A tiny little piece of fish on some bread that they cut up really, really small. That's the reason why Andrew says, what are these for so many? We could feed maybe 50 out of the 5,000. Just maybe. But he still brought him. He still had faith that Jesus could do something with it. He knew that if anyone could do anything with so little, Jesus could. And so we see in these verses what becomes a miraculous royal Feast. Look at verse 10. Oh, this and this is so amazing. So amazing. It gives me the chills. Jesus said, have the people sit down. Now there was much grass in the place. So the men sat down in number about 5,000. So Jesus has them sit down. Text says there's much grass in this place. Where are they again? Where did Jesus go for this? The other side of what? The Sea of Galilee. So here they are next to the sea in a desolate area, but there's much grass. And Jesus says to the people, sit down, sit down on the grass. Do you know what the posture was for eating in the ancient Near East. We see it later on in John's Gospel. John 13, 23 talks about when John reclined on Jesus' bosom as they were eating. So then, the people who had seen the signs that Jesus was doing followed him to the other side of the Sea of Galilee and there they reclined on green pastures. What does that sound like? The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. This is the fulfillment of Psalm 23, where the good shepherd has the people lie down in green pastures beside quiet waters, and he restores them, he feeds them, you prepare a table before me. Like, this is what Jesus is doing here, feeding the 5,000. Oh, how each one of the stanzas of Psalm 23 was literally being fulfilled at this moment. It's incredible. In Esther 1.6, King Xerxes throws a royal feast. And it says, there were white cotton curtains and violet hangings fastened with cords of fine linen and purple and silver rods and marble pillars and couches of gold and silver on a mosaic pavement of porphyry and marble and mother of pearl and precious stones. What a beautiful royal feast that was that Xerxes threw. Matthew Henry writes this. Our Lord Jesus did now show in a divine feast the riches of a much more glorious kingdom than that. Jesus' feast is a much more glorious feast and it displays a much more glorious kingdom even than Xerxes kingdom and the honor of a more excellent majesty even a dominion over nature itself Jesus did not need Xerxes gold to show that his glory far surpasses that of earthly kings 
And so Jesus took the loaves and he gave thanks. The traditional uh, Jewish blessing for meals, before you eat in a Jewish, traditional Jewish household, the blessing goes like this. Baruch atah Adonai, Eloheinu melech haolam, hamotzi lechem min haaretz. Amen. Means blessed are you, O Lord, our God, King of the universe, who brings forth bread from the earth. Every observant Jewish family prays that before their meals, every time they eat. Hamotzi lechem min haaretz. Bring forth bread from the earth. But here in our text, in John 6, we, we see Hamotzi lechem min hashamayim, the one who brings forth bread from heaven. Jesus is bringing forth bread from heaven. He's doing this miraculous thing. I don't know. You know, the text doesn't say. I've tried to just imagine it. How is this even possible? Here's one basket of loaves of bread and fishes. And the disciples are like taking the bread or Jesus is breaking it. I just imagine in my mind, almost like a, just because of how juvenile I am, almost like a video game. Like another piece of bread, another piece of bread, another fish, another fish, another fish. And the fishes are like sprouting out. The bread is sprouting. And every time they give a piece of bread and a piece of fish, they look back down and their basket is still full. It's still full. There's just two fish in the basket. They don't run out. The disciples reach in. They give a fish. They look back. There's more fish. How did it happen? It's because... Jesus is God. That's how. Because he's the same one who said at the very beginning, let the oceans teem with fish. And it was so. Just by the word of his mouth, by his divine fiat, his command, he's able to multiply them over and over and over and over People are all grabbing. I, I have to imagine it took quite a while. The disciples are running back and forth. The people are sitting in groups. And they're running back and forth. Get more fish and more bread. And they're distributing it all. Oh, how they must have marveled that they themselves were participating in a genuine miracle. Marvelous miracle. Even the people themselves could see that it was a miracle. They're the ones who at the end say, truly, this is the prophet who has come into the world. This is him. They saw this miraculous sign. Every time bread and fish were distributed, more appeared. In an act reminiscent of creation itself, Christ keeps multiplying them until the multitude was stuffed. And then... He tells the disciples to gather up all the pieces. So the people are eating so much, they're taking a big amount. They're like, mm, this tilapia is amazing. And they're eating it and eating it until they can't eat anymore. They're stuffing the bread in and they can't eat anymore. And they're like, wow, there's a bunch left over. And the disciples are to go and pick up all the pieces that were left behind. And how much did they have? Twelve baskets full. Twelve baskets. The boy brought one basket. You know what? No one ever talks about. No preachers ever talked about this. The multiplication of the baskets. <laughs> All right? I'm just saying. All right? I'm not saying that that's a real miracle. But what I uh, maybe they just had baskets laying around. All I am saying though is like, where did they get the baskets from, man? <laughs> right? For real. Jesus isn't like knitting the baskets together. Somewhere they found baskets. Empty baskets. And they're going around and picking up all the pieces. Twelve baskets. How many disciples are there? It's twelve disciples. Enough for each disciple to have an entire basket of bread and fish for themselves to eat. They probably could have eaten for a whole week on that. 
12 whole baskets of groceries? It's absolutely marvelous. Absolutely incredible. Christ provides for those who labored to distribute the miraculous food. Look at verse 14. Therefore, when the people saw the sign which he had performed, they said, this is truly the prophet who is to come into the world. When the people said this is truly the prophet, they were referring to Moses' prophecy in Deuteronomy 18 that a prophet like him would arise. What prophet was ever like Moses? It's Moses whom God used to do these tremendous miracles. Do you know, I was talking with somebody about this just the other day. I think people tend to think as they read the Bible, or even if they're not reading it at the moment, but just kind of thinking about Bible times, that like everyone in the Bible saw miracles every day. Just miracles, a miracle, miracle, miracles. There's miracles all the time. That's not true, actually. It's not true. There were three main periods or epochs in Bible history where miracles were very prominent. The first is during the time of uh, Moses and Joshua. During Moses' time, Moses and Aaron and Joshua are doing miracles. And then it drops off for a long period of time until about 800 B.C., where we see Elijah and Elisha rise up, and then they do these amazing miracles, tremendous miracles. So Moses and Joshua, and then there's like a gap of the miraculous in the Bible timeline. And then Elijah and Elisha doing these amazing miracles. And then after that time, there's another gap until Jesus and the apostles. Moses says that a prophet like him would arise. (laughs) When had that ever happened before? Never. Never. Who did the kinds of amazing things that Moses did? These people saw what Jesus was doing, and they said, this is truly the prophet who is to come into the world. Jesus is the fulfillment of Moses' words. When the Israelites were with Moses in the wilderness, God sent manna from heaven. And here, the true bread from heaven was among them. And he is distributing bread to the people. You can see the parallels here. Here they are in a desolate place. There's no supermarkets around. Where are we to go to buy bread? Where can we buy bread, Jesus said. There's no stores around. The Israelites were in a place where they couldn't go and buy bread. And God provided for them. Here the same God, this time incarnate in flesh, provides for the people. He gives them bread and fish. And they eat to their heart's content. Remember what Jesus said to the Pharisees in the last chapter? That they did not believe Moses' words. So because they did not believe Moses' words, they would not believe in him. Even though they claimed to put their trust in Moses, they didn't believe what Moses wrote because Moses wrote about Jesus. Well, at least many in this crowd did believe. They did believe. They saw the sign and they said, surely this is the one. This is the one about whom Moses was writing. The fact that all four Gospels record this event of the miraculous feeding of the 5,000 signifies its great importance in the inspired author's eyes because it shows so forcefully the compassion and the love and the power of Jesus. What are the compassions of the most merciful men compared to the tender mercies of God in Christ. Jesus would not send the crowds away without teaching them and healing them and feeding them because he knew their need and he 
cared about them. He cared. He's the compassionate Savior. Well, that's one of the things that drew me to Jesus at the first and still does to this very day. The fact that we have a Savior who understands us, who knows what it is like to be us. He put on flesh and dwelt among us. He was tempted in all ways and yet was without sin. I think about the hidden, so-called hidden years of Christ. You know, what's amazing is at Jesus' baptism when God the Father speaks out of heaven and he says, this is my son with whom I am well pleased. God the Father was well pleased with Jesus before Jesus had ever done a miracle. Before he had ever preached a sermon. He was well pleased with him before any of the events of the three years of his earthly ministry took place. He was well pleased with him. Why? Because God was well pleased with him during the rest of his earthly life. Before the events of the Gospels take place when Jesus is baptized and begins his ministry. That means that God was pleased with Christ as he was a child. He's pleased with him as he worked in his stepfather's shop. When the people saw Jesus, they said, isn't this the carpenter? Isn't this the carpenter's son? It's what Jesus was doing. He was working. He worked for a living, you know that? Jesus actually worked for a living. He was not just an itinerant preacher. We, the Gospels tend to focus on that more in the three years of his earthly life and ministry. But Jesus spent far longer time in the carpentry shop than he ever did preaching. You know that? Isn't that amazing to think about that? It's just what we know about him. What else do we know about him? When Jesus begins his ministry, it says that he was in the synagogue, as was his custom. What is it, as was his custom? It means that that wasn't the first time Jesus went into the synagogue. He had been going to the synagogue his whole life. When Jesus is just a young lad, probably about maybe the same age as this young boy, and his parents bring him into Jerusalem for a festival, and then they go back home, and no, oh, Jesus isn't with them. Where is he? And they go and try to find him, you know, 12 years old. And where is he? He's in the temple. And what does he say? His mother says, why did you do this to us? And Jesus says, didn't you know I had to be about my father's work? <laughs> That's amazing. It's amazing. Certain things we actually do know about Jesus' life before his ministry begins. And that in all of those things, he pleased the Father. He knows what it's like to be in heavy Jerusalem chariot traffic. He knows what it's like. He knows what it's like to deal with customers. In his father's shop, his stepfather's shop. He knows what it's like to deal with siblings, half siblings. He knows what it's like. He knows us. He has compassion on us. He understands what it is to hunger, he understands what it is to thirst. When he stops in John 4 at the well, what does he say to the woman? Will you give me a drink? It's because he knows what it means to be thirsty. His disciples had run out of food. That's why they went into Sychar to go and buy food. Christ understands us. And because he understands us, means that his compassion for us is real. It's real compassion. It's a felt compassion. For he suffered. He understands what it is to suffer. He's a man of sorrows and familiar with suffering. 
So that no matter what we are going through in our lives, we can know that we have a Savior who's already been there and our suffering does not compare to His. It does not compare to His. He suffered more than we shall ever suffer. But we can go to Him knowing that we have a God who really, really does understand us. That's why He's qualified and He alone is qualified to be the wonderful counselor. He is. Jesus is the wonderful counselor. And he really cares about his people. He cared about his people's hunger. Do you believe that? That Jesus cares about you? If not, why not? He has proven his care and his love for us at the cross. We can never doubt the love of God in Christ. All we have to do if we ever want to be assured of Christ's love for sinful humanity, all we ever have to do is look at the cross. Look where he went for us to save us. Look what he took. One hymn writer wrote this. When the even tide is nearing, Jesus knows and cares. When the light is disappearing, Jesus knows and cares. When with tears the eyes are filling, anguish deep the soul is thrilling, peace he brings, his heart is willing. Jesus knows and cares. Jesus is willing and able to meet all of our needs. We see that even here in our text as he was unwilling To send the crowd away. He had to provide for them. Jesus cares about us. When we find ourselves in an impossible circumstance. We need to remember that what is impossible with man. Is possible with God. Jeremiah 32.27 says this. Behold I am Yahweh the God of all flesh. Is anything too hard for me? No. No, not even feeding a multitude of people with five loaves of bread and two small fish. Hallelujah. What a Savior. I can't wait for us to continue going through John 6 as these truths about Jesus being the bread of life and what we truly need from him is spiritual life are expounded to us and... Uh, We'll learn about this, Lord willing, in the coming weeks. Let us pray. Oh, Lord, our Savior, we are so grateful for you. We're so grateful that you care about us. You cared about the crowd. You were unwilling to send away the crowd. You told your disciples that they had to go and give them something to eat. And then you provided for them. Lord, let us see that everything we have comes from your hand. You provide for us as well. You even give us the breath in our lungs and the strength in our muscles. You give us the ability to work. Truly everything that we have, our homes, the food in our refrigerators, Everything that we have comes from you because you love us, because you are benevolent and beneficent toward your children. You always do what is good for us. Thank you for displaying that to us here in this wonderful text from John 6 today. Be with us now and always. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. We're going to sing uh, hymn number, what is it, 722. Wonderful words of life. Let us stand and sing together now. Sing them over again to me, wonderful words of life. Let me more of their beauty see, wonderful words of life. Words of 
life and beauty. Teach me faith and duty. Beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life. Beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life. Christ, the blessed one, gives to all wonderful words of life. Sinnerless to the loving call, wonderful words of life. All so freely given, wooing us to heaven, beautiful words, wonderful Sweetly echo the gospel call, wonderful words of life. Offer pardon and peace to all, wonderful words of life. Jesus, only Savior, sanctify forever. Wonderful words, wonderful words of life. Beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life. And now may the God of peace who brought up our Lord Jesus from the dead, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you complete in every good work to do his will, working in you what is well-pleasing in his sight. Through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever and ever, and all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. May God be with you all.